James chapter 4 is where we're going to be finishing the chapter this morning. Have you ever had your plans thwarted? Maybe at work you begin the day with the intention of accomplishing a certain set of goals certain set of tasks, and by the end of the day, you realize that through no fault of your own, you've spent the whole day doing something else entirely. Maybe an unexpected illness has caused you to have to put off or postpone the family vacation that you had planned. Maybe you're a mom. I'll just leave that right there. Maybe your computer crashed right before that big presentation for a college class. Our plans get thwarted to some extent all the time. And it certainly can be a source of frustration. But somehow, though, it doesn't stop us from planning, does it? We improvise. We modify the plans. We make new plans. But the fact of the matter is, plan as we might, we are not ultimately in control of whether those plans are accomplished. Because things happen to us that we cannot control. And I mentioned a few things already, but the, the, this is true on a larger scale as well. You guys remember Gordon Hayward, right? Played for the Utah Jazz. Uh, a couple of years ago, he decided to go to, uh, he left Utah to go to Boston. He was excited for the possibilities. Boston was supposed to be the top, within the top couple teams in the Eastern Conference. But less than six minutes into the very first game of his new season with his new team, uh, Hayward came down awkwardly from a jump and he broke his leg. Right? Just like that, his whole year, his plan for the whole year uh, looked dramatically different from a moment before. An economy crash, an unforeseen buyout might cause you to lose your job. Right? That's also big scale. These are big things. An accident might cause you to be paralyzed for life, or worse, might kill you. You might get cancer. And so often with any of these things, there's nothing you can do about it. You're not in control. But the problem is, all too often, we act as though we are in control. Oh, we might never say it out loud, but it is possible for us to go about our daily lives kind of just ignoring our human frailty, just not thinking about it, as if by not thinking about it, suddenly we can remain in control. That's not how it works. Perhaps worse, we might sometimes recognize our frailty, but think that we are strong enough in and of ourselves to overcome it. Well, God's word tells us that there is a better way to handle our feebleness. So our theme this morning is going to look like this. <coughs> because God is sovereign over every aspect of life, you must live in constant awareness of and humble submission to his will. i say that one more time. Because God is sovereign over every aspect of life, you must live in constant awareness of and humble submission to his will. Let's read James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, 
To him, it is sin. Okay, we're going to go uh, um, actually just slightly out of order in the text this morning so that we can look at the problem first, and then we're going to look at the example that James uses in the first portion, and then the solution. But the problem of thinking the way that verse 13 through 15 describes really boils down to one word, and that word is pride. This shouldn't take us by surprise, because pride is at the root of just about every sin you could possibly think of. At its core, pride is that little something within us that says, I know better than God. I know God said not to eat the fruit, right, in the very beginning, but it seems to me that it will make me wise, and that seems good to me. So forget God. I know better. And you can take that statement and insert any command in the Bible, and it, and it shows how pride is always present in our temptation to sin. I know that God said this, but I really think this. I think I know better. Pride has been the problem in this whole chapter of James, James chapter 4, that we've looked at the last three weeks. In verses 1 through 10, it is pride that causes strife in the assembly. It's pride that causes friendship with the world. And it is humility before God that is the solution in verse 7 and following. In verses 11 and 12, it is pride that causes one brother to stand in judgment over another brother. When in reality, there is one lawgiver, as we saw last week, and we're not him, right? It's pride that caused that. And now we see here in verse 16 that one of the elements of pride is a false sense of self-sufficiency and self-importance. This is a pride that says, I don't need God to live my life. I can do it just fine on my own. And this is drawn out in how James describes the root issue. Verse 16, he says, but now you boast in your arrogance. But now you boast in your arrogance. And this could be taken a couple of ways. The way that I think that uh, translation reads most naturally is that he is saying that they boast in a manner that is arrogant, right? They boast arrogantly or proudfully. But there's actually a second option. And... Um, I'm going to let you determine what that second option is. So I've got a list of um, scriptures, and I hope you can see that okay. Can you read that okay? Uh, we're going to read, read through them, and I want you to look for this word, which is translated boast, right? We see it in verse 16. Now you boast in your arrogance, and I want you to think through these with me and uh, and let's see what the other option would be as far as how we should take this first. So James 1, 9 and, 9 and 10 says, let the lowly brother glory, that's the word for boast, same word, same Greek word, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Okay, Philippians 3, 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Galatians 6, they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 12, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then 2 Corinthians 10, but he who glories, and again, that's the same word, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Anybody have an idea of how arrogance relates 
to boasting based on what we've just read. I know this is unusual, but don't be shy. Okay, that is the common, that's the common denominator, right? We're looking at the word glory or boast. If you look at each of those passages, though, how does, how does what follows relate to the word boast or glory? Okay, right. So in many of those passages, right, in uh, the, the, um, the last one there, let him glory in the Lord, the Lord, you would say, I think what you're saying is, the Lord is the object we should glory in, right? And doesn't that hold true for all of them? What is the lowly brother to glory in in that context. It's in his exaltation, right? Uh, boast in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3, that Christ Jesus is supposed to be the object of the boast in that passage. And it's true for every, it's true for every one of them. In fact, every other time that this word in the New Testament is used, the word for boast, I mean, it's followed, and it's followed by the word in. What follows in is always the object of the boast. <coughs> so look again at verse 16. But now you boast in your arrogance. Arrogance is actually, I believe, the object of boast. We are glorying in, we are boasting in or about our arrogances. And that's the other uh, thing that actually supports this option. The word for arrogance is actually plural in the Greek. And uh, so I, the King James actually captures this option, both translation and the interpretation. I think the best when it says, but now ye rejoice in your boastings. It's like, it's like we're happy about our pride somehow, right? Uh, you're proud of your pride, essentially. It's an emphasis on what the nature of the problem is. So what does this actually look like? Right? One commentator, and you can go to the ne next slide there. One commentator says it this way, and I think this is, I couldn't say it any better. You form your plans for the future as if with consummate wisdom and are confident of success. You do not anticipate a failure. You do not see how plans so skillfully formed can fail. You form them as if you were certain that you would live, as if secure from the numberless casualties which may defeat your schemes. Do you see pride running all through that? I think this is exactly what James is describing as the problem. We have a problem and its name is pride. Another commentator put it this way, you get a certain pride in yourself in planning your future with such confidence. And I think that this assessment of the situation, okay, this, this identification of the problem is gonna help us as we now go back to verse 13 and look at the example that James uses to deal with the subject. So this pride that we see in verse 16 is expressed, I think, in two ways. And these two ways are not unrelated. I think they're, they're very closely connected. Uh, but they do come out in different ways in verses 13 through 15. So the picture James gives us is of some businessmen discussing their plans, right? And their plans are optimistic. They're planning for success. We're gonna go here, we're gonna spend some time, we're gonna buy, sell, and of course, we're gonna make a profit. Not much has changed in the nature of business over the last 2,000 years, right? 
You identify a market, you set the goals, and obviously the end result is you make your profit. <coughs> the goal is to make money, they're planning towards that end, but there's a little problem that James points out that may get in the way of this grand scheme. So verse 13 describes their, their statement, come now, you who say, today, tomorrow, we're gonna go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy, sell, make a profit. But then the problem, James points out, is begun by that little word, whereas, right? That's our, that's our textual clue. Whereas, or in actuality, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. That's a pretty blatant contrast, isn't it? I mean, given that he's just described people who are planning a year out, the, co the time frame contrast is, is blatant. You're saying, yeah, you're making all these plans for next year, but what about tomorrow? You don't even know that. How can you plan for a year when you don't control tomorrow, when you don't know what will happen tomorrow. Um, Stormy, my five-year-old daughter, loves to be active and to do all sorts of things, right? Well, I can picture her having a conversation with Indigo, four-year-old sister. It goes something like this. <coughs> Tomorrow, we're going to go swimming, right? And after that, uh, we're going to go to the park on our bike ride, and then the next day, we'll get a big Lego set and we'll put it together mostly on that day. And then we're going to go to Carly's house and then to Gracie's house and then probably to Macy's house. And then we can have a treat of ice cream. And daddy can be home for two months and we'll play doggy on most days of those. Does that sound good, Indy? And throughout the whole thing, Indigo will be adding her, yeah, right, excited little gestures, clapping their hands. But the thing is, they actually have no idea what's going to happen in the, next, in the next couple of days. And we know this, and yet even while we smile, maybe chuckle, get a chuckle out of their plans because we know that they're made out of ignorance, in reality, we might well be carrying out the exact same thing Yes, on an adult scale, on an adult level, but we don't know what will happen tomorrow any more than they do. And yet we make our plans and we do our things and life just goes on. Well, James continues this thought by expressing to these hypothetical businessmen the reality of their situation. And that is that they are incredibly fragile. Forget their business. James skips straight to something far more, uh, far bigger, right? For the, their, their actual lives, their very lives. Your life, he said. What is it? It's a vapor. Your life is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. The word could be translated a puff of smoke. it goes away. What is he intending by this comparison? I think there's two things. The first thing uh, is its short duration, right? The way he that then interacts with it immediately following how he describes it as appearing for a little time and then vanishing away, that makes that very clear. The short duration that is our lives. You think about that? You think how short our lives is and our lives are? Do you, you know, if you uh, talk to anyone who's older, they're always going to tell you that, right? I have a lot of conversations with people that go along those lines. Um, our lives are short. But the second aspect that I think James has in mind is they're uncertain. Our lives are not only short, like they're short even if you give it the full 100 years, 80 to 100 years. Even then it's short. 
but it's uncertain in addition to that. Right? Vapor is not solid or heavy. It's not well-defined. It is easily moved by the gentlest breeze even. And this is what I think James had in mind considering the first part of verse 14. You don't know what will happen tomorrow. It's not even just about that your life in general is short, but tomorrow you don't even know. What's your life? It's a vapor. You can't control it. But there are plenty of things that could happen in life that we cannot control, and that is essentially um, what we discussed at the beginning. Right? That, that was the purpose of the introduction. Think about the many things that happen that have ruined plans on a large scale or on a small scale. Our lives are in a constant state of uncertainty. This concept is certainly given consideration outside of just this passage as well. Proverbs 27.1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. You might recall Jesus' parable in Luke chapter 12 that really epitomizes this concept. Uh, who knows, this could even be the, the, the teaching of Jesus that James had in mind as he was writing this because of the similarities. He says, Jesus said in Luke 12, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I'll do this. I'll put, pull down my barns and build greater barns. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So many similarities there. Of course, you have the, the planning aspect and then the immediate aspect. James says, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But they don't. And uh, God tells this rich man, tonight your soul is required of you. So the, the first aspect uh, in which our pride comes out is in verses 13 and 14, where I have it there as saying, living as though you will not die. Right? That's, that's pride. That's proud. Secondly, though, in verse 15, uh, we're going to see that living as though God is not sovereign is another nuance to probably the same expression of pride. Verse 15 gives us actually our first clue that planning, the planning aspect of this is not the problem. Look at verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Instead, you ought to say, let's just take out the first phrase, right? You ought to say, we shall live and do this or that. You ought to say that. What he's saying there is planning is not the problem. It's not that we should go through life literally living in the moment, right? That can be kind of a, a hip thing to say or do these days, I guess. You know, I just, I just live in the moment, live for the moment. That's not what this is saying. Okay? Planning is not the problem. We should live. We should say we're going to do this or that. And that's fine. But the problem is when we say it without having the mindset of the first phrase, which is, if the Lord wills. Now, in the Bible, there are two possibilities as to what the will of God refers to, right? His moral will or what he desires or his sovereign will, which is what happens, right? If something happens, then it is in God's sovereign will. Uh, if, something, if there's something that is good or right or desirable according to God's word, then that is his moral will. So uh, every time you come across the will of God in scripture, you have to ask, which, 
kind of will is this talking about? And on the outset, it kind of could make sense either way, right? <coughs> we could say, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we should live and do this or that. In other words, uh, if, if, if it is something that God desires, we should do, we should live to do that. Uh, but it becomes clear both from the context it, uh, verses 13 and 14 and specifically the issue that he's addressing. This is pretty clearly God's sovereign will, sovereign will that is being referred to. Verses 13 and 14 describe someone completely unconcerned about God as it relates to their actions. Unconcerned even about his ability to control or impact those planned actions. And so it makes perfect sense in this context to say, if the Lord wills, or we could substitute sovereignly allows something, then we shall live and do this or that. And I have to say that it may not even be an intentional leaving out. In fact, I would say that probably for most of us here, it's not, in, it's not that we're, um, it's not that we're saying God's not sovereign, right? It's not that we're verbalizing that or even internally thinking that. Instead, it's just kind of a leaving out, like a, a failure to consider that he is. Is that a weird difference? Is it, is it, you understand the distinction I'm trying to make. It's not that we're saying God's not sovereign. It's just that we're not thinking in terms of he is sovereign. And there's a big difference. But I think, honestly, that what, sometimes what we don't think about reveals as much as what we do think about about us. And what that reveals about is a failure to recognize God's sovereignty in every situation. What that reveals in us is pride. That's what it reveals. When you fail to recognize God's sovereignty, you are acting as if you were sovereign instead. You're living as if you're self-sufficient instead of being God-dependent. And this is the pride of life. This is the pride of life on full display. And it's no wonder that James' assessment of this, right? We saw it, we started with this in verse 16. But now you boast in your pride. What are you even thinking? And his condemnation is clear at the end of verse 16. All such boasting is evil, it's wicked. Do not give God consideration in daily life. To assume that our lives are just going to continue on and we are planning and controlling our own destinies. That's pride. And that pride is evil. Okay, so as we move to <coughs> verse 17. And you see the connecting word, therefore, right? Right? You kind of expect that what follows is going to be closely related to what we've just considered. But if you're like me, you kind of look at it and you might do a double take and the connection might not seem immediately evident. Look at verse 17. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. So he's just been talking about the evil of pride, right? And the need to recognize God's sovereignty in every situation. And then he says, so if you know to do good and you don't do it, you're sinning? What exactly is the connection here? There's two options, <coughs> and they're not mutually exclusive. Um, but I think one maybe goes a little bit further than the other. So option one, James is saying, okay, I've instructed you on how you should live so now you know how to live and you are therefore responsible to act on it. In other words, if a person 
knows about the brevity of life and the sovereignty of God and yet refuses to act upon it, insisting instead on boastfully conducting his business while presuming on the future, right, specific to the context, to him it is sinful. Maybe he's still talking to the businessmen, in other words. Uh, one commentator said, they, they cannot take refuge in the plea that they had done nothing positively wrong, right? And that could be part of it, but I think there's actually a better, or at least a fuller, and it is a little bit more broad as well, but I think the, that this option is, is worth consideration. And that is, I think there's actually a contrast between the boastful planning of verse 13 and simply doing what is good. Okay, and I'll flesh it out this way. This, the second is the alternative to the first. It's possible that we might sometimes be tempted to pass up an opportunity to do good in order to accomplish the essence of verse 13, in order to win at life, right? In order to succeed and make that profit. So pride, that, that self-sufficient beast that rears its ugly head so often, it tempts us to ignore, what is doing, d- ignore doing what is good. How? Doing what is good might ruin my plans. If I do what is good, then I might miss an opportunity to succeed for myself. And James is warning you, don't think that way. If you know that there is something good that you ought to do and you fail to do it, it is no less an offense against God than any other sin that you might commit. As far as application, um, I'm going to go several different directions here. Application of this text. Um, we might be tempted to leave it at something like this. Make sure that you, that anytime you speak about the future, right, you make sure you preface that with, or at least end it with, if you're not going to preface it, if God wills, right? <clears throat> I'm going to graduate next year, if the Lord wills. Right. We're, we're, we're uh, planning to increase sales $1 million this year as a company, if, if the Lord wills. I'm going back to college in the fall, if the Lord wills. All right, kids, we're going to go on vacation in just three weeks. Oh, if the Lord wills. Tomorrow I'm going to get these bathrooms cleaned, if the Lord wills. Hey, you want to go play basketball this afternoon? If the Lord wills. Okay, I'm just going to run into the store. I'll be right back out. Hopefully by now you realize I'm kidding. Though it might be tempting to make the application a a simple matter of just attaching these words, like these are the magic words. That's that's obviously not what James is getting at. That's not going to suffice. So how are we going to apply this this text? I think there's three ways. (coughs) And honestly... uh, in some, to some extent, they're just the opposite of how pride is expressed, right? We saw that pride was expressed in living as if you will not die and in uh, acting as though God is not sovereign. So how are we going to apply this text? We're going to say, first of all, that you should live knowing that you will die. You should live knowing that you will die. It is good to think about our frailty sometimes. Think about death. And specifically, think about your death, right? In Ecclesiastes, the wise Solomon tells us that it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. Why would he say that? Why is it better? Well, he gives the answer Uh, in the next verse, for that, what? The house of mourning. That 
is the end of all men. And the living will take it to heart. If you don't think about death from time to time, you're not actually living in the real world. Because in the real world, this life, this physical life that we experience is temporary. And Solomon assumes, and rightly so, that if you think about the fact that you will die, it will change the way you live. Jonathan Edwards was an 18th century preacher who as a young man formed a series of resolutions that he desired to live by. One of them went something like this, resolved to live as I will wish to have lived when it is my time to die. How will you wish to have lived when it is your time to die? Live that way now because you don't know the number of days that you have left. So that's one application. Secondly, live knowing that God is sovereign. He created this world that we live in. Right? He sustains it each and every day. And there is literally nothing that happens in the world that is outside of God's control. Everything that we've said about our inability to control life's circumstances, none of that applies to God. He's sovereign. God has no such limitation. He plans and he controls. We just plan. God plans and controls. So think about that when things go wrong, when plans fail, when money is tight, when kids are sick, when someone close to you dies. And... Think about that when, God, when uh, things go right. When you get that dream job, when you get engaged, when you have a baby, when you get a raise, all the good things in life that we consider. God plans and controls those things too. So live in constant awareness of God's sovereignty. Now, the third one is more general, and I, I want to flesh it out just a little bit. The third one is live humbly, why is that in there? Because pride was the problem, right? So live humbly before God in light of those two truths. What does that look like? Yeah, just in everyday life, what does this look like? For starters, it looks like verse 17, right? To him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, it's sin. So one thing that it looks like, living humbly before God is looking at those opportunities in a different light and doing the good and right? doing what is good. That's the alternative to the proud lifestyle that he's just expressed. So speak that word of encouragement. Be the friend <coughs> to the one who's not in the cool crowd. Warn the one who's going down the wrong path. Help the weak. Take the time to listen. Give of your time and your money and your stuff. Why? Not because it will benefit you. That's the proud way. Not because it will benefit you, but because that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it won't benefit you because life isn't about you. Do it because it's good. And this is what God's word says. It also living humbly before God in light of these truths also looks like including God in your planning. Now, I joked about it earlier because I wanted to make the point that the words themselves are not magic, right? It's not a magic charm that makes everything okay. It's not something that you add to whatever you were gonna do anyways, just as a, a thing you do because you're a Christian. But now I want to be serious, though, and ask you, do you live in the mindset of verse 15? Do you live in that mindset of including God, of, of, of living, if the Lord wills, in your day-to-day -day life? Do you think about how God's sovereignty impacts, for example, your ability to accomplish something at work every day? 
Do you think about how God's sovereignty impacts how your children will, will, will turn out? Do you think about how God's sovereignty impacts even the effectiveness of attempted ministry? Reaching out to those around you, do you think about how God's sovereignty impacts that? You think about how God's sovereignty impacts your financial decisions. Verse 15 is about living in a mindset where you habitually live like this. God, I've got some plans going on here, and this is what I'm trying to accomplish, but I realize that you may have something else in mind, and that's okay. So if I'm on the right track, please bless me. And if I'm not, please redirect me. This would be living in that mindset, that awareness of God and his sovereignty. Whether you say those words or not, the question is, are you thinking that way? Are you including God in, how you, in, in the lens through which you view life? Are you factoring in God's sovereignty to that? And then finally, to address the pride directly, I think we ought to recognize the supreme foolishness of pride. And we need to consciously choose to reject it. You realize that our world constantly encourages this pride of life. This very thing that James is addressing here, our world today is full of that kind of, of encouragement to, to live in that direction. My family uh, loves the show American Ninja Warrior. And uh, it's a, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's, a, it's an obstacle course show. Uh, different athletes, people from all walks and stages of life compete on these obstacles. And it's really just, it's fun. It's fun to see how far each person goes and where they fall, where they mess up, what you could do better and all that. It's, it's, it's great. And throughout the whole show, there's, there's um, backstories. And they always have inspiring backstories of athletes and contestants. And the whole idea is these guys are overcoming obstacles in life, just like they're overcoming obstacles in the show. And it's great. It's inspiring. Uh, and I don't mind any of that. But it's very common to hear them say something to the effect of, if you just believe in yourself and work hard, you can do anything, right? Just believe in yourself and work hard and there's nothing that, 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 is, that you won't be able to do. And of course, uh, that's coming from the lips of someone who just overcame something huge and, it was, and it's inspiring and it's great. But think about the statement. Think about the implications of that. You can do anything? No, you can't. No, you can't. There is value in hard work, right? Of course there's value in hard work. There is even value in self-confidence. And I'm not even denying that. There, it, it, it's a good thing if you can be confident about something. And, and there's, there's not harm in that in and of itself. I'm certainly not saying we should just bash ourselves all the time. That's not what humility is. But the fact, those things, while factors, are not the final determiners of success. God is, because he's sovereign. There are obstacles that you can't overcome. as unpopular as that might be. They're out there because God is in control, not you. And to act as though we are in control, the, the kind of pride that's described here in this passage is the height of foolishness. It's the pride of life. And this is the main point of the text. Run from the lie of self-sufficiency. Run from the lie of self-sufficiency. It is not true 
and instead trust in the sovereign hand 